Okay, so regression discontinuity involves five or six specific steps that we need to follow um, to determine if there is a gap and then measure the size of that gap and then compare the different gaps that we measure. Um, so what I did is I typed these steps in a separate document and just pasted them here. Um, these are the steps that we're going to go through um, to see if we can see if there's a causal effect of this tutoring program on exit exam scores. That's the main question we're going to be asking. Um, so let's go through each of these steps in turn. So step one, determine if process of assigning treatment is rule-based. There is no statsy way of figuring this out. There's, we can look at the data set. Um, there's no way of knowing from just the data if assignment to tutoring is based on a rule. The only way we can know that is if we do research about the program, we know about it, and we know that tutors are only available to students who score 70 or less on the entrance exam. That's the only way we can know it. There's no stats there. Um, so step one is just like you tell a story about your data and say this is rule-based because it is, um, or it's not rule-based, and so we should stop because it's not rule-based. So step one is fairly easy. You just say, is it rule-based or not? Um, step two, and so we can just type this here. It is rule based because it is. Okay, step two. We want to determine if the design is fuzzy or sharp. Or not just the design, like we want to determine if the, the split between people who used tutoring and did not use tutoring is fuzzy or sharp. So we want to make sure that there's nobody who scored a 71 who is using tutors or somebody who scored a 65 is not using tutors. So we want to plot um, two of our variables here. We want to plot the running variable and then split it across um, people who participated in the program and did not. So to do that, we're going to insert a new chunk, which again is Command Option I or Control Alt I or click on this little thing. And we're going to see if this is fuzzy or not. So I'm gonna name this chunk fuzzy or not, or sharp or not, or whatever we want to call it. Um, so to do this, we're just going to use ggplot, um, and we're going to put two of our variables into this graph. So we're going to say ggplot, the data set we're looking at, so we can say data equals tutoring. Our mapping is where we use the AES function to take um, columns in our data set and map them onto specific parts of our graph. So we want our x-axis to show the running variable. And the running variable in this case is the entrance exam score, which is called entrance underscore exam. So if we come back here, we can say x equals entrance exam. On the y-axis, we don't want any outcomes or anything. We just want to split um, these points by whether or not people use tutoring or not. So our y is going to be tutoring. So we're going to say y equals tutoring. And then just for fun, we'll also color these points um, by whether or not people used tutoring. And we'll make this a little bit wider like that. If I run this chunk now, I will get an empty plot. Beautiful. The reason it's empty is because we didn't tell ggplot how to actually show these aesthetics. Like we put entrance exam on the x-axis, it's there. Um, we put tutoring true and false on the y-axis, yay but we didn't tell ggplot what to do with those things. So at the end of our ggplot function, we can add a plus sign and say geom point, and we'll add points for each of those things here. And there we go. So that's kind of a really boring, ugly plot. It looks like a solid line here. Um, that's not actually a line, it's just a whole bunch of dots that are just on top of each other. Um, so we can do a couple of things to improve this graph um, because it's, it's ugly, it's not very intuitive. Um, one thing we can do, we have an issue with overplotting here, um, meaning like there are too many points on top of each other here and it's really hard to see any differences in there. So one thing we can do to fix overplotting is shrink some of those points. We can say size equals like 0 0.5, see what that looks like. The dots are smaller now, that's neat. Um, we can also make the points a little bit more transparent. So if we use alpha, if we say alpha equals 1, that's exactly what we see here. There's no transparency at all. If we said alpha equals zero, um, it should make completely invisible dots. Yep, the dots are there. You just can't see them. They're invisible now. 
So if we say like alpha equals 0.5, that means each of the dots is going to be halfway invisible, um, which we still have issues with overplotting here. Um, it's hard to see what's going on. So one last thing we can do is we can jitter these points. Um, we don't really care if some of these points are above or below this true line. Like everything in this area is going to be true. Everything down in this false area is going to be false. So we can kind of randomly um, shift some of these points up and down to spread them out a little bit. So to do that, we can say position equals position underscore jitter. If we just do that, it will shuffle all of those points. So that, that looks cool. It's all spread out like that now. Um, one problem with doing that, though, is some of these points may have been down here. Um, it shuffled all of the points just all over the place, up and down and side to side. We don't want them to be shuffled side to side because that matters. Like that's going to be like this point could be 80 um, and now it's like in the 70s, but it was over here because it just happened to be shuffled that way. So we want to control the jittering a little bit so that it doesn't go side to side. It only goes up and down. So to do that, we can say width equals zero, meaning it won't jitter side to side. Um, and then we can say height equals something. If we say height equals one, I think that'll go like the full distance. That's too much. So that means it's going from like down here to false all the way up to super true. Um, so one is too big of a height. So if we shrink that down, let's try like 0 0.25. That should cluster it kind of nicer around the true and false stuff. If we want it even narrower, we could shrink this down to like 0.15. And now we kind of get these little strip bars. That's neat. Um, the last thing we can do right now, if so pay attention to where this dot is here, because that's going to change. Right now it's below the true line. If I do it again, it's going to be above the true line. Every time I make this plot, that dot's going to be somewhere else. So I'm, every time I re-knit this document, the picture is going to be slightly different, um, which can be annoying. Um, so if we want it to always be in the same random spot, we can set a seed. We've talked about this in previous sessions. Um, and that seed is kind of the starting number for the random number algorithm thing that R uses to generate random numbers. So if we say seed equals like 1 or 1, 2, 3, 4 or whatever, it doesn't matter what the seed is. It just has to be a number so that now if we run it, that single dot is just barely above the true line. If we run it again, it should be in the same spot. And every time we run it, it's going to be in the same spot. So that's good. Cool. Um, so now we don't have overplotting issues, and that looks nice. Um, but we can't really see the cutoff. Like we know there's a cutoff here. Um, that should be 70 right there. Um, there's nobody on that side. But it'd be nice if we had like a line that went straight up and down at 70. And we can add that with another geom layer. We can use something called geom underscore v line for vertical line. And this takes an argument, or if we say x intercept equals 70, it will draw a vertical line at 70, is basically what that's doing. So if we look at it now, there's our vertical line at 70. And so the main question we're asking here is, is this design fuzzy or sharp? And this looks pretty sharp. It doesn't look like anybody used tutoring that scored above the 70 mark on the entrance exam. And it doesn't look like anybody did not use tutoring um, when they should have, like low scorers, no false values here. So that looks pretty sharp. Um, we can also kind of confirm this numerically. We can get actual counts and proportions to see how many people um, did not use tutoring and scored under the threshold. So to do that, we can do some grouping and summarizing um, using dplyr. So I'm going to insert a new chunk here, and we're going to we're going to use the tutoring data set. And we're going to group by a couple things. We're going to group by tutoring, um, because that's our kind of treatment and control group. And then we want to group by whether or not somebody scored above or below the threshold. So to do that, we can actually do a little bit of math right here inside group by. We can say entrance exam is greater than or equal to 70. And then we want to summarize each of those groups. And we'll make a new variable called count. And that will just be the number of rows in each of those groups. So if I click on play now, um, notice how it's only showing two 
groups. Um, the tutoring, people who didn't use tutoring um, and had an entrance exam score greater than 70, and there's like 700 of them. And then there's people who did use tutoring and they had a low score, and that is their count there. Um, there are no other groups. We don't have anybody who used tutoring and had an entrance exam that was low or anything, or that was high. Um, so judging by the picture and by this table here, we can safely conclude that this was a sharp design. Um, there's no non-compliers um, either not using tutoring when they should or using tutoring when they shouldn't. So we can proceed with sharp discontinuity analysis.